Keith May from somewhere, Historic England, and I also have a, an AHRC fellowship. So I'm going to be talking about work I've done uh, as part of research funding from UKRI. But you can see there's a whole bunch of people there I need to talk about. I actually should look at this, shouldn't I, instead of turning around. Um, so I put James Taylor as a co-author because we're kind of working on, we've been working on one project I'm going to talk about, which has completed. And now we're moving on to another project because we got follow on funding and therefore the other names at the bottom, you may recognize a couple of people in the room, Kenneth Ageson and Doug Rocks McQueen are part of the new project, which I'll talk a bit more about. So Landwood are on there. And I will go shout out for Kerry A. Binding at University of South Wales, where I also have a visiting professorship. That was the other thing I was meant to say. And hopefully, where's the button that goes forward? Oh, I didn't do that, did I? Sorry, I was meant to talk while I did that. That's just me indulging in this project called The Matrix, as you might have guessed. Where's the forward arrow on here? I just, oh, I just hit the thing. Um, so, as I kind of summarised right there, I'm going to talk a little about a data problem which originates a lot of this work, a lot of work I've been doing over probably the last 20 years of trying to make data interoperable. We, a lot of you will know the issues around that. But in particular, in that work, I've kind of come back to trying to kind of distinguish some of our questions around how do we use data that is primary evidence as opposed to in secondary interpretive data, which I think is pretty critical, a lot of issues around that when we do things like conceptual modeling and semantic mappings, et cetera, et cetera. This boils down to going back to trying to look at what happens in the, what I mean, we, archaeologists call post-excavation, for better or worse, this kind of, where most of the kind of analysis goes on of the data once it's come off the site. So I'm going to talk about the first project, project one, the matrix project, which has completed, but we started off thinking we were going to go and talk to people about what their processes were, but what we kind of under, un, not undermined, uncovered that, in fact, there isn't much documentation about what goes on in post-excavation formally. It's, it, it's less, doc, less formally documented than recording practice, where people have to go out on site and dig, and therefore you there's a plethora of recording manuals and recording sheets, et cetera, and that's great, but there's less of that in post -ex. So the second project is now looking this archaeologist's guide to good practice handbook is about how we might distill practice from post -ex into something that is useful for people up online, both as practitioners in, in doing actual commercial archaeological field work and writing it up, but also potentially for students as well, because it really struck us as well as and, and early career practitioners in the field that until you've gone through quite a lot of work, often you don't get any experience in what happens in post text and there isn't a lot of stuff out there telling you what, what you might want to know. And I believe that understanding that process of analysis will better will improve what people do in the field because they'll actually understand why they're recording the stuff in the what people are going to do with it afterwards. So the first project, quickly to sort of sum up, when we talked to people, we kind of said, "What is your process?" And I went round to ten may well several major archaeological. In fact, I didn't go around because then COVID happened. So I talked to a lot of people online through Zoom including Kedis from talking about fame and who it was useful to talk to. And as I say, initially the idea was that I would look at what their post-ex manuals procedures were and kind of pull out the commonalities in that. As it turned out, we had trouble finding any examples of that, apart from a shout out to, if there's a, the people from Headland probably just walked into the room. Alex Smith at Headland was working on the A14 and there are some good examples we got from that. And people like Museum of London, they have manuals, but a lot of the stuff is kind of internal documents and they're kind of not really kept up to date and people learn this stuff much more by doing it, you know, and a experienced person tells them how they did theirs. So they find out how they want it done through that. So 
basically this this is just to sort of summarize this idea we talked i talked to major archaeological units i won't list them but you can probably imagine the main archaeological units i say uk mostly in england but it included uh aoc and people and the idea was to do this sort of understand this process and produce ideally a sort of process model of how the main stages that people were going through i don't expect you to read the details of that the main point of this was oh that hasn't come up yes it has come the different sections on this diagram kind of to represent the process in terms of people what people kind of would conventionally think of an archaeologist doing field work then they come out of the field they do the analysis they like, like write it up they might put it all together into a publication and put it into an archive and that's kind of a, a for that bottom line if you've got the money if you haven't got the money if you're doing commercial archaeology it's much more complicated hence the top line and some of those red boxes kind of suggesting that unless you've got enough money to get through to publication the things that end up in the archive are much more a kind of I won't say side product but they are variable and that's I push that you can see the difference that I'm saying there between commercial and for want of a better word research funded stuff but the main point here is also that in terms of data there are different stages and data you know the data you come off the excavation is not necessarily the data that ends up in the final publication because you have to go through a bunch of specialist analysis and depending on what you find on the site you don't necessarily know what you're going to need to be analyzed and dated and, and the, the level of dating and, and, and data travels and the it wasn't in this session I was in the other session. data management plans came up next door but DMP standard data management plan the point being here to some extent if you're going to have a data management plan your data will travel so you may need to kind of note that the, the where different variations come in as the data goes through key point to say it shouldn't just be a tick box we should be actually trying to use some of these management data management plans in the long run hopefully to in a sense to identify how some of the data has been used in the process but the real thing there is I don't see it as just a linear process it is actually a kind of research cycle process so one of the arguments for why should we care about how this data travels through is that we want our data to be usable we talked about reuse we use reusability of data for the next people who come along who may be either dig a bit more of that site or dig the site next door particularly in a commercial scenario I mean a lot of this is talking about kind of commercial archaeologically driven development funded driven stuff I want to talk about stratigraphy because we kind of focused in on stratigraphic data as a as a case not even say case study but it was a not a, an important part of the record which we had been trying to use to join up lots of other bits of information and of course going back to sort of the origin of the what we call the single context recording method if you want to call it that Harris matrix stuff that we were we were trying to work with this is how Harris is ver probably a version of what I just put up in a way is in his publication 89 he was again identifying that you go through these steps through the publication to archive but of course things have changed since 1989 and now as we see you can do lots of things like RTI or we go out and we use GIS, we use structural motion, not to mention Bayesian chronological analysis. And all these different methods, I would argue, have altered, again, the way those bits of data end up in, in our current archives. And to some extent, I would argue, will new methods will come along and we will continue to come up with wizardly new things to do. And we need to kind of understand our process and keep that how we track that up to date because otherwise when you go to the archive and you're a PhD student trying to do some work on Bayesian chronological modeling you will find strangely that you can't find very much so for example out of what does it say on here it, it was an early it, we took 37,000 oasis records this is like five years ago there's now about 100,000 in England plus a load in Scotland she got a sample of about 10,000 out of ADS of which we she managed to find that ring set is about I think it's actually 358 
that said they might have a stratigraphic matrix diagram. But in fact, even when she looked at those, a lot of them, and of course, a lot of them are just PDFs. So if she wanted to use them, she's faced with typing seven, 5,000 contexts back into no. So this is just to illustrate that, yes, you can do it the good old way, which you get Alex Bayliss to come out and lie on the floor of your site hut with a massive big bit of paper to do your, to join up all your different stratigraphy. And that is literally a Chattel Hewitt doing it because James was directing at Chattel Hewitt. So thanks for that photo. But yeah, there's, sort of that, there's a semi-serious point and a bit of a joke in that, but you get the, the gist. Uh, is that doing anything? Yes. So this, this is just to give you a flavor of what we did on Matrix, because in fairness to Kerry, who's probably talking literally as I am next door, Kerry Binding at the University of South Wales, we did a whole bunch of built a piece of software so that we could test out as a prototype. So when we went to talk to the archaeologist, we kind of said, what is it you actually need to do with a Matrix piece of software? Why are you not using this stuff? And there are all sorts of reasons that I don't have time to talk about, but we'll happily talk to you at, over a coffee. The main point of this one was to talk about uncertainties, which is why, because of the chronological Bayesian model is the most interested in the reliability of the, of the dating data. And so we incorporated into this ways of comparing the stratigraphic above below relationships with things like Allen operators for temporal modeling. So you're starting to see here where those red and different colored things are in our data table, it's kind of showing up reliability between, yes, where the stratigraphy said it was above, below, and the dating says it's earlier and later, as opposed to where actually some of the dating evidence is saying something completely different. And that it's not to say it's wrong, because this is archived data, and I actually, to be honest, I seeded it to make sure there were some wrong ones. So fairness to Mola, that wasn't wrong, but it is, to help people as they're going through, to make it useful for people to say, actually, you might want to go back and ask your dating specialist whether that's actually what they meant. Uh, now I'm going to get stuck on there because it won't move. Okay. How long have I got? Oh, okay. So second project is now called the Archaeologist's Guide to Good Practice. You'll Shout out to ADS because they already have G's to GPs or whatever. So we picked this up sort of in like the arc uh, as an idea to say originally that that web page is something that Steve Roskins put up in York, which Frederica Hammer wrote coming out of the DUA in the 1990s. Um, and it's been up there, it was up on the York website till about six months ago, <laughs> but it isn't there anymore. Just to add, just there was a point that these things come and go. So we're trying to make this thing sustainable up online. And that's one of the tasks Kenneth, myself, Doug, and James will continue to work towards with fame to see if we can actually make it useful enough to people that not every unit has to write its own manual anymore. But perhaps it would be good if we all shared at least some parts of this all together. And it might help make the data that comes out of it more consistent too. So big reveal, that's the address. If you want an address, I'm not going to hit that link, but it's up there. There's a bunch of pages. It's still currently under consultation. It's not finished in any means. In a sense, it's up on a kind of wiki base that we are asking people to contribute. We want to point if, if, individual units have their own manuals, we can still point to that and people can kind of integrate it and say, look, here's an overview, but we still want you to actually use our way of entering data into our own internal systems, because that clearly everyone is still going to maintain their own kind of data sets too. But do go and have a look. One of the things we really think is important is to identify outputs. So one of the things we're trying to do in here is say, what are the key outputs that come out of this? Do they come out as digital outputs? And if they do, and those outputs end up in a digital archive, such as the one called ABS, can we track those through? So this example, that spreadsheet is a, is a spreadsheet I pulled off from this data set. That is the CSV on ADS, and that's how I sucked it down, and that's the work what I use 
I had to rebuild it all into the using that Excel phasing table on the left to make to make some of that stuff in the phaser software test testable. But the real point is to signpost these where these things rely, reside online, and then hopefully we will be able to sort of help people understand where the data where the key data lies. Something else I'll briefly touch on here is I also want, as part of this, one of the one of the areas of inconsistency in the records is even even the simple thing like where did we stop is not consistently recorded. It kind of is. I mean, certainly in, in Museum of London they put no NFE, no further excavation. But even distinguishing whether they stopped because they got to what we mostly call natural, or whether they stopped because the developer didn't need them to go any deeper and there was actually stuff underneath. Those, those things, just having that consistently recorded so that we can map those things together would allow us to draw that big red line that Matt Edgeworth calls the boundary A between the Anthropocene and whether you want to call it the Anthropocene or not. So, there are some key things we need to understand about this hand, but whether it's feasible, really, we only have a year. I got this money as what they call follow-on funding, which is a bit bizarre, but it means that we've only got about a year to do it. But hopefully, we're going to try and produce something which is useful enough that people will want to sustain it. I think in terms of teaching people and CPD, it, 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 there's a good case for that. Even if you know, and and hopefully we can kind of embed it a bit more into practice. Question up there is: Does anyone know of anything like this anywhere else in the world? Because I'd love to know. I asked that question at EAA, and of course they, nobody did. Um, and this is just a slide I end on most of the time, which is banging the drum for avoiding archiving loads of stuff that we don't use. Uh, but let's try and make the stuff that we do archive useful and not just a PDF that then someone has to retype in. I'm interested in things like where the conventions, what I was talking about, the boundary A stuff, even some simple conventions for recording practice would be really advantageous. And Ed, actually, Ed Harris is on our advisory panel for this, so we were actually talking about how we could take some of that forward internationally. I mean, not everyone records single context, but we could still record the bottom, even if you're digging in Locus or whatever they do in Germany, Planum. No, no, he shakes his head. And shout out for data management plans, fair data, I believe. Oh, and that man at the bottom said something useful once ago, and he's here. Thank you. <laughs>